There is no indication that this national championship game between two Bulgarian soccer teams would cause such media hysterics 80 years after the fact. It is the 28th minute of the second half. Levski Sofia is in firm control of the game and is constantly on the offensive. The Macedonia Skopje players are holding out and manage to keep the score level. A cold March downpour beats relentlessly on a waterlogged pitch. Despite the inclement weather, the teams are supported by a large and noisy crowd. The blue centre forward Petrov is a constant threat and makes deep incursions into the penalty area of the Macedonia Skopje. One of them results in a sharp, powerful shot that is deflected off the inside of the goalpost. The ball bounces back onto the pitch. The referee points to the centre spot. The Macedonia players protest loudly but to no avail. The referee is adamant that the ball crossed the line and Levski have scored. During the 1930s, Europe was at the tail end of the Second Industrial Revolution. Technology, culture and art were booming. Later, this period would be dubbed the Interbellum, the time between the wars. Europeans sensed the inevitability of war and lived their lives as if all life would come to an end. Three destructive ideologies threw a growing shadow over the old continent. Communism, fascism, and Nazism. They found adherents even among the ruling classes. Sir Oswald Mosley founded the British Union of Fascists. Hurrah for the black shirts, screamed the most widely read UK newspaper, the Daily Mail. The Nazi salute was also gaining ground around Europe. However, no Roman depiction of it was ever found. Its origins are to be found in Jacques-Louis David's painting, The Oath of the Horatii. Broadway staging of Ben-Hur helped it spread. We see it in the Italian silent movie, Cabiria. Earlier in the 19th century in the US, the salute with an outstretched arm symbolized allegiance to the flag. And since the 1920s, it has been popular in Italy, Austria and Germany. At the time, it meant nothing more than a thumbs up. December 1935, four years before the onset of World War II. London, White Hart Lane, the home of Tottenham Football Club. A game is at hand between the national sides of England and Germany. Tottenham is supported by many London Jews who are shocked by the government's decision to allow the swastika colours pride of place next to the Union Jack. 
An hour before kickoff, the boss of the FA walks into the changing rooms of the English team and politely asks the players to raise their hands in the Nazi salute together with the Germans. The players are happy to oblige. The decision reflects the official policy of Number 10 Downing Street. British PM Chamberlain's government is adamant not to offend Adolf Hitler. The world's most powerful military is too close to the sceptered isle. The British are reluctant to start a war with Germany. At the same time, the plans for a cheap, mass-produced vehicle already sat on Ferdinand Porsche's bureau. Unbeknown to him, Hitler would influence the lifestyle of generations of Englishmen. Those who like to travel overseas to follow their favorite teams, drink themselves into a stupor and fight their adversaries from the opposing crowd. And sometime later, after the Beatle came out, those who like to travel in the VW bus. Hundreds of thousands of British hippies would get as far as India in it. The Spanish Civil War started in 1936. Later, some would call it a general rehearsal for World War II. In the UK, Edward VIII ascended the throne and would reign for less than a year. He quickly gained fame for his high Nazi sympathies. After his abdication in 1937, he visited Hitler in his Bavarian residence, Berghof. To the glee of the National Socialist press, Edward greeted the Fuhrer in the proper Nazi way. Four years later, Edward was caught on camera teaching Elizabeth, the future Queen of England and the rest of the royal children, how to perform the Nazi salute. In 1936, that fateful year, Nazi Germany hosted the Olympics. Zum Feier der 11. Olympiade neuer Zeitrechnung als eröffnet. The Führer was possessed by desire to show the superiority of his new order. The rest of the world found itself to be the sideshow to this enormous propaganda event. German athletes won the greatest number of medals. Hitler was triumphant. Bulgarian Tsar Boris III stood next to him. He did not raise his hand in salute because he was Bulgarian royalty. In May 1938, the English soccer team returned the visit. They won this encounter too and again disappointed many of their compatriots by choosing to salute the hosts the Nazi way. And the English team in white shirts give the Nazi salute during the German national anthem. Joseph Goebbels, Hermann Goering and Rudolf Hess were in attendance. Of the highest ranking Nazis, only the Führer did not turn up. He had promised to be there but evidently chose not to, probably sensing his side was going to lose. In the summer of 1938, Bulgarian Tsar Boris and his consort, Giovanna, toured Europe. They first visited Benito Mussolini in Italy. They then went on to Britain to stay with their relations, King George's family. The world was in the midst of the worst political storm in a decade the Sudeten crisis. Nazi Germany had already annexed Austria and was looking over at Czechoslovakia. England was ready to do almost anything to avoid conflict with Germany. Tsar Boris related Mussolini's desire to improve relations with the United Kingdom. The message was met enthusiastically, 
delivered as it was by a cousin of the king and former German ally. Boris's next stop was indeed Germany. Averse to all vanity, he had accepted the unenviable task to mediate between two increasingly hostile sides. He was related to the ruling house of one and depended on the other for his country's economic growth. He met with Adolf Hitler and Hermann Goering and warned them that peace had no alternative. Four days after Boris's talk with Hitler, the British and French Prime Ministers met with the Führer and Il Duce too, this time in Munich. As a result, the Sudeten were annexed to Germany. In July of 1940, Hitler and German Foreign Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop invited to Salzburg the Prime Ministers and Foreign Ministers of Bulgaria and Romania in order to discuss a peaceful solution to the Dobrudja question. During the Second Balkan War of 1913, Romania stabbed Bulgaria in the back and occupied southern Dobrudja. Under the circumstances, most great powers believed that the Bulgarian inhabited province must be returned to its rightful owner. After some heavy negotiations, Bulgarians and Romanians reached an agreement, which was formally signed on the 7th of September. Bulgaria got back southern Dobrudja, including the towns of Silistra, Dobrich, Tutrican and Balche. On the 21st of September 1940, troops from the Bulgarian Third Army crossed the now defunct border and reoccupied this old Bulgarian land. They were met with joy and flowers by the local population. However, Bulgarians had a lot to worry about. According to the British diplomatic representative in Sofia, George Randall, Dobrudja was formally given over under German and Italian tutelage and rejoicing took the form of enthusiastic gratitude towards our main adversaries, hence doing incalculable damage to our cause. Many who had been hesitant, had not taken sides, were swept in this wave of pro-German enthusiasm. Success in peacefully revising the Treaty of Nyai changed the focus of Bulgarian diplomacy to Macedonia and Eastern Thrace. The disintegration of the Ottoman Empire made Bulgarians the dominant ethnic group on the Balkan Peninsula. All the others united against them, which set the stage for a bloody prominence of the Macedonia region. Bulgaria, Serbia, Greece and Montenegro came together for the first Balkan War in 1912 and mobilized 1,200,000 troops against the Ottomans. 700,000 of those were Bulgarians. After, savage battles produced thousands of casualties and resulted in an Allied victory. Large tracts of Thrace and Eastern Macedonia came under Bulgarian control. Serbia took over Kosovo and northwestern Macedonia, Greece, Epirus, many Aegean islands and southern Macedonia with Thessaloniki. The negotiations regarding the new borders were torturous and led nowhere. The impasse led to the Second Balkan War. 
This time, it was everyone against Bulgaria, not just its former allies, but Romania and the Ottoman Empire. Naturally, they won. Serbia and Greece almost doubled in territory. Bulgaria lost most of Macedonia and southern Dobrudja. The Ottomans regained eastern Thrace. The Great War ended. Bulgaria on the losing side again. More territory was lost. The region around Stromitsa, the Morava River hinterland, Timok and surroundings. The new masters immediately began what can only be described as ethnic cleansing. Seventeenth of November, 1940, Berghof. Adolf Hitler's residence in the Bavarian Alps. World War II has been underway for over a year. The Führer and the Reich Minister for Foreign Affairs, Joachim von Ribbentrop, renew their offer to Tsar Boris and Bulgarian Foreign Minister Ivan Popov to attach Bulgaria to the Axis. In this way, the country's armed forces would take part in a joint operation to take over Western Thrace and Aegean Macedonia, land Bulgarians considered rightfully theirs. At that moment in time, Bulgaria was strictly neutral. The monarch carefully declined the offer, but was very aware that further delays might have fatal consequences for his country. In a situation like this, Bulgarian neutrality looked less and less plausible. Inside the country, the communists were growing more active by the day. They insisted that a new order must be established in Europe under the gaze of comrades Hitler and Stalin. The Tsar had not forgotten an oath he had made on the day of his coronation. But I will tell you something tonight. As long as I am on the throne, no Bulgarian soldier will go to war. I swear to it, I will never allow Bulgarians to be forced to leave the country in order to fight beyond its borders. The negotiations went on. The Germans were adamant that their troops needed passage through Bulgarian territory in order to push the British out of the Balkans and fortify their own right flank for the future invasion of the USSR. The war entered a decisive phase, but Bulgaria stuck to its neutrality. The German reply was, we will cross your country without your permission if there is no other way. The Tsar was tormented. Inevitably, the German troops will enter Bulgaria. If we don't let them, they will occupy us and divide us up into protectorates. We cannot depend on English help. Neutrality is a wonderful thing, but how do we maintain it? To fight the Germans in order to stop them is pointless. The great powers failed to do so. How can we? It wasn't any easier for the neighbors. Greece was locked in a savage conflict with the Italian aggressor. The Germans had promised the regent and government of the Kingdom of Yugoslavia, Thessaloniki, but the country was abuzz with anti-German sentiment. The British Secret Service organized a coup and the kingdom left the Axis.
The British are active in Bulgaria too. They managed to turn entire groups of Bulgarian society against one another. The dilemma ended on the 1st of March 1941 at exactly 1.35 p.m. in the palace of Belvedere, where the Bulgarian Prime Minister Bogdan Filov signed the protocol for the country's entrance into the Axis Pact. The Wehrmacht entered Bulgaria at 12.01 the same day. Adolf Hitler's reaction to the coup in Belgrade was lightning fast. The same evening, he signed a directive for the invasion of Yugoslavia. Within a week, the multinational Yugoslav army had fallen apart. Bulgarian army units drove into northwestern Macedonia and eastern Thrace, the very lands lost after World War I. Unlike the Cryova Treaty that resulted in the return of southern Dobrudja to Bulgaria, the agreement that allowed Bulgarians to reclaim these lands also granted unlimited rights to the Third Reich to exploit their natural and human resources. Borders were temporary. The real status of the new territories was that of German occupation zones, divided up into administrative units with partial presence of Bulgarian troops and civil servants. War or no war, soccer was still being played in Bulgaria at the time. New administrative divisions were formed and joined the Bulgarian Football Union. Dobric, Bitola, Skopje. The Macedonia Skopje team was part of the latter. And was something of a challenge for the other Bulgarian teams since it was full of good players with experience from the Yugoslav Championship. Of course, the Yugoslav League was not contested by a team bearing the name Macedonia. In the Kingdom of Yugoslavia, Macedonia was banned. A mere 10 years before the events described here, Yugoslavia had finished fourth in the World Cup in Uruguay. Soon after the enthusiastic welcome Bulgarian troops received in what had been Yugoslav Macedonia, it adopted the social and administrative structure of the Bulgarian Tsardom. The revitalization of this long neglected region was well underway. First, the people needed to be fed, as the brief but violent war had left many starving and the infrastructure damaged. In 1941, investment flowed from Bulgaria to this forgotten land. Seventy billion lever in all over the next three years, almost a third of the Bulgarian budget. The infrastructure in particular was restored and often built from scratch. An important holiday, the 24th of May, was celebrated jointly and theatres, libraries and cinemas opened at a quick rate. Bulgarian 
са с пръста на майката отечество. Както никоя земна сила не е в състояние да раздели тази напоена с българска кръв земя, така и никой не ще може да разпокъса вече обединеният български народ. Macedonia was being transformed. New schools, hospitals, banks, railway lines and train stations, ports, civic and industrial projects went up. Roads were built, wetlands drained and given over to agriculture. Canals were constructed. Всяка сутрин няколко нови автобуси потеглят от Скопие за Кюстендил. Съобщенията между старите предели на царството и новоосвободените земи ще става с нарочно уредена автомобилна служба. Заварени в окаяно положение, сега шосетата в Македония са поправени и са годни за бързи автомобилни съобщения. 64 cultural, sports and other societies were established by the end of 1941 alone. Among them, the Macedonia and Varda FCs. A branch of the nationalist paramilitary organization, Branik, came into being too. A hundred and twenty thousand youth of both sexes signed up. They were divided into bands for boys and wreaths for girls. Sport was paramount. Младите бранички търсят прохлада в студените води на ручи. За пръв път в пловните състезания за държавно първенство участват и пловци от новоосвободените зими, от Охрид и от Беломория. Българската жена, която в много области догонва постиженията на мъжа и в безмоторното летене не остава назад от него. All this was exotic to European observers. Here is the legendary Sofia Lake Ariana. In the snowy winters of yore, it brought everyone together for much joy and merriment. That is how you make champions in various disciplines. Here is Fats, ski jump champ. Borislav Zetkov, Zhuk, was a record-breaking sprinter. How do you stop a striker like him? The legendary fighter pilot, Lieutenant Dimitar Spisarevsky, who would die defending the skies over Sofia, played for that team too. He must have felt he was going to die young and left us a small illustration. Levsky bombards. Levsky does not stop. His family was intimately connected to the fate of Macedonia. His uncle, Kosta Spisarevsky, a lawyer, diplomat, journalist, was also an active member of the IMRO. Before he rammed a US bomber over Sofia, the lieutenant was commander of the 2nd Liaison Company at the flying school in Skopje. Sofia had been the capital of Bulgaria for only 60 years, However, it was the capital of a millennium-old state. There were only three empires in Europe in the 9th century, the Byzantine, the Frankish, and the Bulgarian. Language, in the case of Bulgaria, Alphabet II, the literary tradition and orthodoxy, the first Christian denominations, were the three weapons Byzantium and Bulgaria utilized to become spiritual leaders of Europe in the Middle Ages, all the way until their downfall and the rise of the Ottomans. Five centuries later, Byzantium is but a faint memory. Bulgaria, however, was resurrected as the third Bulgarian kingdom with its language, religion and history intact. Its fate would be to struggle to preserve itself in the 67 years following the Treaty of Berlin. In 1914, at the outset of the Great War, there came into being a club that will forever be known as the Club of the People. Levski was named after a Bulgarian national hero. 
the ideologue behind the anti-Ottoman struggle, Vasil Levski. Football was being played in the Varda Banovina as the Serbs renamed Macedonia. The regional champion there was Grazdanski Skopje. On the 10th of August 1941, the local teams Grazdanski, SSK, GSK, Pobeda and Jug came together to form one team. A general meeting of the local citizenry decided to name the new club Macedonia. Industrialist Dimche Hadjitanov was elected as first chairman. One of the team's godfathers was the military commandant Colonel Stefan Tarolezhkov, who was born in Ichtiman, near Sofia. The players bore Bulgarian names, spoke, wrote and read in Bulgarian, and there was nothing controversial about that at that time. Naturally, the team leadership was later assumed by Dimitar Chikatrov from Prilep and Dimitar Guzelov from Doiran, both members of IMRO. Both were active members of the youth organization as students, as was revealed to be so by the Serb authorities in 1927, and were sentenced to 10 to 20 years jail, respectively. As Bulgarian patriots, they took part in setting up the National Action Committees in 1941 and aided the Bulgarian authorities in Macedonia. Guzelov became director of Radio Skopje. Macedonia played Levski for the first time in Skopje in March of 1942. The locals were leading 2-0, but Levski was in control of the game and attacked incessantly. The sports newspaper reported this. The Macedonian defense held out and did not allow a change to the scoreline until the 28th minute. One incursion of Levski's center forward Petrov resulted in a powerful shot that had the ball deflected off the top right-hand corner of the goal. The referee, who was but six feet away from the spot, deemed it a clear goal. The Skopje players protested. They claimed no goal had been scored, but the referee remained unmoved. Some of the Skopje players left the pitch, others kept on arguing. The referee gave them the mandatory three minutes to return to play, and when they failed to do so, after five, he stopped the game and himself left together with the Levski team. According to the rules, the score had to be 3-0 to the visiting team. The Levski players, too, were inclined to willfulness, but in an altogether different manner. They protested before the game by refusing to raise their arms in the Nazi salute. This was not harmless. For a variety of reasons, Bulgaria was the Third Reich's closest ally. The war was at its peak. Such an obvious statement by the country's leading team could have serious political consequences. The Fuhrer could take it personally. But there was no law mandating the Nazi salute in Bulgaria. Rather, it was an internal regulation of the Football Association and it stayed that way. The team was fined 10,000 leva, which equaled four teachers' salaries. No personal penalties were imposed. Still, other teams protested the fine. Macedonia was not among them. They had followed the internal regulations of the Bulgarian Football Association and had raised their arms before the controversial game. Moreover, they reported the case to the Police Directorate, Unit A, Public Safety. Your players. Even though they were urged by the Macedonia Skopje captain, Blaje Simeonov, and then by the referee, refused to perform the salute. Then your player, Mladen Jurov, one of the Macedonia Skopje's team members, Trice Serafimov, with the words, fascist puppet. All of the above, I reason why I order you and the persons, Stoyan Stoyanov, Mladen Jurov, and Radi Maznikov to appear before me. Head of Unit A, Public Safety, Nikola Geshev. 
Bulgarian sportsmen showed character on other occasions and in the end wrote their names into history. Slavia Sports Club, together with the Bulgarian Orthodox Church and other organizations, stood firmly against the deportation of Bulgarian Jews, a move demanded by the Fuhrer himself. Tsar Boris and most of his government took the side of his nation. What followed was the epic game on the 3rd of May that began with an exchange of flowers between the captains. At the insistence of the Macedonia Skopje, and as a gesture to the guests, Todor Atanasov was appointed to be referee. The game was hotly contested, but sportsmanlike, and ended in a two-all draw. Two more games were played by the end of the year. On the 11th and 18th of October 1942, both were won by Levski, who ended up winning the championship. At the concluding ceremony, the officials honored the worthy runner-up, Macedonia Skopje. They conceded defeat. As the club president, Chikatrov said, Levski had all the luck and beat us this time. I speak for all my players and the club when I congratulate them for the title. Spitz the coach. Congratulations to Levski. They were motivated, energetic, and with better technique and understanding of the game. They beat us twice and we acknowledge their strength and supremacy. The coach, Ilesh Spitz, was a Hungarian Jew and a respected name in the game. Despite Bulgarian anti-Semitic legislation, he did not wear a yellow star and was protected by the authorities. German reports on the status of Bulgarian Jews disapprovingly stated that barely 20% of them wear the badge. Those who do wear them as a point of defiance and pride, together with badges depicting the Tsar and his consort. The Germans had to resign themselves to the fact that no Bulgarian Jew would ever be deported beyond the national borders. Jews numbered 50,000 at the outset of the war and 52,000 at its end. We know that from a letter of the Central Consistory in Sofia to the Paris Peace Conference in 1946. Bulgaria saved its Jews, but had no power over the fate of those residing in the German occupation zones in Macedonia. Military expediency at the threat of a UK-US landing in the Balkans at the beginning of 1943 led the then German command to clear out all Jews from the Macedonia and Aegean operation theatres. They were deemed to be a potential threat, a fifth column. The Bulgarian army and administration, mainly consisting of local people, was subject to decisions by the German authorities. This was the price Boris had to pay in return for not sending Bulgarian troops to the Eastern Front. In the commotion, Spitz, the coach, was marked for deportation too. Dmitar Chikatarov asked the Bulgarian authorities for help. Chikatarov was well known in Sofia. The Regents Council even had him in the running for a ministerial position. Lawyer Kirill Drangov also vouched for him. Member of IMRO's leadership, he was extremely popular for being the son of Bulgarian military legend Boris Drangov. The news quickly reached Bulgarian National Sports Federation head Ivan Batenbergsky. He urgently organized a meeting with the Interior Ministry and Spitz was taken off the train on Serbian territory. He was now issued Bulgarian ID papers and left for Great Britain. Spitz and the rest of the Jews were saved, but Bulgaria was once again on the losing side in a world war, a war it never wanted. Yugoslavia was now a republic under Soviet influence. Macedonia was once again part of it, one of six new Yugoslav republics. Tens of thousands of Bulgarians were killed or sent to concentration camps for refusing to call themselves Macedonian. The Macedonian nation had been a project of Soviet social engineering since the 1920s. At the beginning of the 1930s, the Comintern 
produced a document outlining plans for the creation of a Macedonian nation. Up until then, the Kingdom of Yugoslavia had tried and murdered or imprisoned Bulgarians for their ethnic adherence in accordance with the law for combating Bulgarian bandits. Joseph Stalin gifted Macedonia to Yugoslav communist leader Tito and repression became all-encompassing, even in the parts formerly belonging to Bulgaria. A Macedonia Skopje team was disbanded the following year due to supposed fascist activities, subject to investigation by a specially appointed commission. The players joined another team, Pobeda, and together formed Vadar. History repeated itself. Nothing in Macedonia could be called Macedonia. Scarier times came after that. But what happened to the main protagonists in these events? Levski's coach, Asen Panchev Pancheto, became a referee. The chairman of the club, Stoyan Redjov, emigrated to West Germany. The goalie, Radoslav Maznikov, was taken off the train to Dubnica by the communist militia and disappeared without a trace. He was on his way to a friendly game in Blagovgrad. The whereabouts of his remains are unknown. There were mass shootings in Macedonia at the same time. During Orthodox Christmas 1945, over 1,200 Macedonian Bulgarians lost their lives. 23,000 more were killed later and 130,000 sent to prisons and concentration camps, only on account of them being Bulgarian. The fate of the saviors of Spitz, the coach, was tragic too. After the regents were condemned to death, Batenbergsky was one of the few protesting citizens. One of the militiamen guarding the convoy broke his skull with the butt of a rifle and he died on the spot. Dimitar Chikatrov was tried by the new Serbian authorities in Skopje, together with other Macedonian Bulgarians. Dimitar Guzelov and Spiro Kitanchev. Their crime was in trying to instill a Bulgarian spirit in the population of Macedonia and in having devoted their lives for the union of Macedonia and Bulgaria. Kitanchev was sent to the Idrizovo camp, where he died as a result of sustained torture. Chikatrov and Guzelov were shot near Skopje. The latter told the judges before they sentenced him to death as a Bulgarian fascist, Who are you to try me for my work? I served my people. Who do you serve? 75 years later, Macedonia is a state bearing the official name of Republic of Northern Macedonia, a fragment of the long-dissolved Socialist Federative Republic of Yugoslavia. The government in Skopje ordered a film to be made outlining this story. The Czech Republic and Serbia joined the project. The result was Third Half, an imagined tale of the game between Levski Sofia and Macedonia Skopje. It was actually a Comintern document made into a novel and filmed for mass consumption. The Bulgarians are shown as cold-blooded murderers. May God forgive you, friends in Skopje. Truth and freedom are still unattainable dreams for you, despite the fact that thousands of Macedonian Bulgarians died for them. Forty years earlier, the legendary revolutionary Gotza Delchev, who fought for the liberation of Macedonia, wrote this in faultless literary Bulgarian. Splintering and divisions must not frighten us. Yes, it is a pity we should be so fractious, but there is nothing we can do. We are all Bulgarians and we suffer from the same disease. Bulgaria's national hero, Vasil Levski, whose surname bears the team of the people, uttered these prophetic words. Before all, 
we should finish the work here, closer to shore, and only gradually should approach Macedonia and Thrace. This must happen in all corners of our fatherland. We cannot expect help from anywhere, nor should we desire it. Whatever we achieve, we must achieve through our own exertions. It is only right and proper this way. We cannot expect help from anywhere. Such is this story in which no one could expect help from anyone, not even from the referee. Last half. It needs to be told in order to explain those terrible times in the history of Europe. An explanation has so far only been provided by the winners. And Levski was a winner. The team that carries the name of the Apostle of Freedom. Levski. <laughs>